good morning class in today's session we are going to see about a uh, multitop mass spectrometer you might have heard what is a mass spectrometer so we'll be first discussing in brief what is a mass spectrometer what are the basic components and uh, how does a normal or a conventional mass spectrometer work then we'll be going into the detail of what is a multitop mass spectrometer to give you a peek into it Multitop mass spectrometer has MALDI as the ionization source and TOF or time of flight as the uh, mass analyzer. Okay, so in uh, a very brief, that's what is Multitop mass spectrometer. So we'll see the specific use of mass spectrometer when it comes to the field of proteomics. Okay, so let's start with the presentation. So let's start with the topic of MALDI-TOF. In the beginning, we will see what is a conventional mass spectrometer, okay, that we see in labs all around, right? Most of the bioanalytical labs will have a mass spectrometer. So mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry, or abbreviated as MS, is an analytical technique that relies on measuring mass to charge ratios of the analyzed samples for the purpose of identifying the amount and type of the co chemical compounds that exist inside the molecules. So from this, you'll be able to understand that you'll be uh, analyzing a given sample both quantitatively as well as qualitatively. Okay. So we said that we'll be looking at the mass to charge ratio, right? So what is mass to charge ratio? So different ions are deflected by the magnetic field by different amounts. Uh, what do you mean by this? Suppose an object is moving in a particular path, okay? Suppose you have, you have thrown a ball and it's moving in a particular path, in a particular direction or in a particular, uh, it is having a particular track. Suppose you are subjecting it to an external force, okay? You, just imagine you have thrown a ball and a bird comes and hits it. What happens? When such an external force is applied, um, an object that was moving in a particular path will be deflected from the path, right? When an external force is applied. Now, how much is the object deflected? It depends on many things, but majorly it depends on the mass of the object, right? So suppose you, you, you have thrown a cannonball, okay? a bird hitting a cannonball and a bird hitting a tennis ball, you will see the difference in both, right? A tennis ball will be deflected to a more uh, distance or from, it will deflect from the path uh, more than a cannonball because cannonball is heavier. It is difficult to, uh, what is it, <laughs> uh, deflect a cannonball just by a mere small bird, right? So for a given force, how much a, a particle or how much a, uh, any object is deflecting will depend on its mass, right? The lighter it is, the more it will be deflected. In case of atoms, in case of, uh, you know, in molecular level, when, when we are talking, it will also depend on the charge, okay? So for example, the principle behind mass spectrometer is that you, if you have electrically charged particles or ionized particles and they're moving in an electric field, when you apply a magnetic field, it acts as a force which deflects that uh, electrically charged particle. So how much it is deflected will depend upon the charge of the particle and also the mass of the particle. Okay, so that is in nutshell the concept about mass, uh, mass and charge. And uh, we'll see what is mass to charge ratio. So the amount of deflection depends upon the mass of the ion. That is lighter the ions uh, are more deflected or sorry, lighter ions are more deflected than the heavier ones. The charge of the ions, that is ions with two or more positive charges are deflected more than ones with only one positive charge. Okay. So these two factors are combined into the mass to charge ratio. So mass to charge ratio is given by the symbol of M by Z or M by Z, however you prefer naming that alphabet. Okay, so for example, if an ion had a mass of 28 and a charge of 1 plus, its mass to charge ratio would be what? It would be 28, right? 28 divided by 1. Then again, if an ion has a mass of 56 and a charge of say plus 2, would it would have a mass to charge ratio of again 28 because 56 divided by uh, 2 would be 28, okay? 
then m by z or m by z mass to charge ratio is dimensionless why do we say that so considering the mass spectrometry measures mass to charge ratios one might expect it to report measurements of m by e or m by z in the combined si unit of kilogram per coulomb right because you have mass in kilogram coulomb is your charge uh, the unit of charge so it should be like that but actually the mass that is there which we are talking about right uh, that is not a normal mass so i'll be discussing why it is dimensionless so in contrast the mass to charge ratio should be considered a dimensionless quantity and always be abbreviated as m by z or m by z representing the ratio of the mass of an ion to the unified atomic mass so that is your m your m is not the normal mass it is actually a ratio of mass of an ion to the unified atomic mass unit so mass by mass gets cancelled so your value of m is actually or your dimension of m is there's no dimension for m divided by the charge number z so what is the charge number so the charge number is defined as a ratio of magnitude of charge of the ions in coulombs over the elementary charge of a single proton in coulombs so again coulombs by coulombs that gets cancelled off so your z is also a dimensionless quantity so when you have mass which is your dimensionless quantity and uh, the charge number which is dimensionless quantity both of them when you take the ratio that mass by charge becomes a dimensionless quantity okay so the mass to charge ratio is usually denoted as m by z and the quantity unit for the m by z variable is dimensionless okay somewhere uh, where, whenever you read uh, more about mass spectrometry you might come about come about uh, with ratios like m by q or m by e and in those cases there will be slight differences in the units so many scientists claim that that is a much better method uh, or a met better way to analyze the particles but generally when we are talking about mass spectrometer in our case we will be considering m by z as dimensionless so don't get confused if you see any units for mass to charge ratio in some research papers or somewhere okay it's it's a bit debatable topic okay then what is the mass spectrum another important um, uh, what to say part of mass spectrometry is the mass spectrum that is the final deliver deliverable right so the mass spectrum is a graphical representation of the ion abundance versus the mass to charge ratio of the ions separated in the mass spectrometer so mass spectrometer is going to separate the ions based on the mass to charge ratio so you will get a spectrum or a graph in which you will have a uh, on on the y axis you will have the abundance ion abundance how much it is there how many how much quantity of the ion is there versus what is the mass to charge ratio okay a mass spectrum is usually presented as a vertical bar or bar graph in which each bar represents an ion having a specific mass to charge ratio and the length of the bar indicates the relative abundance of the ion so what happens in a mass spectrometer is whichever analyte you're going to analyze first of all you're going to ionize it and during the ionization the molecule actually fragments and you have different ions of the same uh, coming out of a molecule right so what is the abundance of those ions and what is the mass to charge ratio based on that you will get a mass spectrum okay so the most intense ion is assigned an abundance of 100 and it is referred to as the base peak okay in relation to it percent intensity is assigned to each signal which represents the relative percent abundance of each fragment so i'll explain it to you with the example of carbon dioxide okay so most of the ions formed in mass spectrometer have a single charge so the m by z value is equivalent to the mass itself so if your charge is one now most of the time what happens is the charge is plus one okay and so you have the m mass by charge ratio will be always almost numerically numerically equal to the mass okay so here's an example of the mass spectrum of uh, carbon dioxide okay it's one of the uh, simplest molecules you can consider and it consists of only three atoms carbon oxygen and oxygen co2 right so the molecular ion is also the base peak so base peak we discussed was the most abundant ion so when you're carrying out the mass spectrometer co2 will be the most abundant ion that you will be seeing okay so that will be assigned a relative abundance of uh, an abundance of 100 so that will be given the maximum value so you can see over here this is the peak for co2 it is assi assigned as 100 okay relative to that we will assign the abundance relative abundance of the other two ions which are possible fragment ions that is carbon monoxide and oxygen 
So you can see in comparison to the base peak, we will be assigning the relative abundance of carbon monoxide and oxygen. So that is how a mass spectrum is uh, derived. So this is for a simple molecule. When you look at complex uh, molecules, it will be a bit difficult to actually analyze it. But most of it is computerized and uh, we don't have to worry about that. Okay. So the old MS techniques took advantage from the ionization of the sample by bombardment of the analyte with electron beams. So I told you, right? For an analysis purpose, you'd have to carry out ionization process. For that, you'll be bombarding the analyte with electron beams. So this method of ionization typically results in breaking the sample into thousands of charged fragments. So molecules in the analyzed samples could then be identified by correlating the known masses to the resultant patterns of the fragments. So although the con conventional MS techniques were quite common and applicable in many different areas of research, they were only capable of offering hard ionization. What is hard ionization? Hard ionization techniques are processes which impart high quantities of residual energy in the subject molecule, that is your analyte molecule, invoking large degrees of fragmentation. So the electron beams, they have so much of energy and due to that, the analyte molecules will be fragmented you know, into very small pieces, okay? And one of the common examples of hard ionization technique is electron ionization or EI, okay? That is what you will see in a conventional MS. So what are the basic components of an MS? Uh, uh, if you look at any mass spectrometer, there'll be three major components. So what are those? First one is the ion source. So that is for producing gaseous ions from the substance being studied. Whichever uh, analyte you're studying, you need to have the gaseous ions. Okay, only then you'll be able to analyze it further. So first one is the ion source, which creates or which makes the analyte into gaseous ions, you can say. Okay, it has to ionize as well as turn it into gaseous way. Second one is the mass analyzer. So you, ha you have your charged particles or ions. Next, you'll be doing the mass analysis, okay? So for resolving the ions into their characteristic mass components and according to their mass to charge ratio, you require a mass analyzer. Then third, you have a detector system. So that is for detecting the ions and recording the relative abundance of each of the resolved ionic species. So that's for detection as well as giving you the final mass spectrum, okay? So this is a basic diagram that you can have a flow chart for an MS. You have sample introduction, then you have the source where you have the formation of gas phase ions. Then you have the mass analyzer where you, have, where you sort the ions according to their mass and mass to charge ratio. And then you have the ion detection where you will be detecting which ion you know, has been deflected and what you have got. Then you have the data system which will give you the data output as a mass spectrum, okay. And this is the main, uh, basic functioning of a mass spectrometer, conventional mass spectrometer with an uh, EI system. Okay, so what happens over here is, I'll just go and read, this is not our MALDI technique, this is a general uh, mass spectrometer. Okay, what happens is you introduce the vaporized sample from one end, and here, you know, you'll have a filament which will be uh, giving out electron beams. So once a sample is coming in, it will be bombarded with uh, electron beams. So, and why it is going in, it will be going from here to here because there will be a positively charged plate over here. So whatever electrons are emitted out of here will be attracted towards this uh, a positive plate. So when such an electron beam is being formed now and you're introducing your sample from here, the sample is bombarded with this electron beams. What happens in that process, your uh, sample gets positively charged, okay? Uh, because of these uh, electrons coming and bombarding with it, it uh, sample gets positively charged. So what happens? You have another positively charged plate over here. I hope you can see it in the diagram, okay? What happens because of that? If you have a positively charged analyte and you have a positive plate over here, it will repel it. So once it is repelling, it is those analyte molecules are kind of streamlined to pass through different positively charged plates over here. So you get a stream of positively charged analytes that is coming into this uh, mass analyzer, okay. Now what happens inside this mass analyzer? So suppose your mo molecules or uh, your fragments ions are passing like this, you have an electromagnet over here which provides a magnetic force. So what will happen is if you have a charged particle, it will be deflected according to its mass and its char uh, charge. So the lighter molecules will be uh, deflected more, the heavier molecules will be deflected less, 
Okay, so that is how the deflection is happening. And later in, you have a detection, then you have an amplifier, then you have a chart recorder. So this is the basic working principle of a mass spectrometer. Okay. Uh, this is another diagram that shows the same thing. You can see the electron beam over here. You can see a positive grid, sample is injected. It goes between the plates and there's an electromagnet over here. Detection happens and then you get the record. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> that is in general about mass, uh, mass spectrometer. But our topic is Maldetov MS. So how did Maldetov MS come about? So the rise of Maldetov MS. Let's see that. So analyzing biomolecules. So some biomolecules are too large and can decompose when heated. And traditional techniques will fragment or destroy micromolecules. So by now you know that it, uh, the ionization technique is going to do cause fragmentation. But in case of biomolecules, it can also destroy the macromolecules. Okay. So earlier, there was no technique available to preserve the molecules during the ionization or to minimize the chance of fragmentation. So you can imagine if you're, you have a biomolecule to be analyzed, if in the initial stage itself it is decomposed or destroyed, how are you going to, you know, uh, analyze it uh, if you don't have any sample to be analyzed because it is destroyed in the first step. So you could not analyze it using that. Then what happened? Uh, in 1985, soft ionization technique was established by two scientists from Germany named Hillenkamp and Karras. Okay. So soft ionization refers to the processes which impart little residual energy onto the subject molecule and as such result in little fragmentation. So in hard ionization, you had a lot of or high residual energy which was given onto your analyte molecules, right? But in soft ionization, the amount of energy that is transferred to your analyte is very less. So that uh, causes the ionization of the analyte, but without fragmenting it or without, uh, what to say, destroying the sample, okay? So in this technique, the molecules are protected from fragmentation during the ionization procedure by the presence of the matrix. Okay, so it, a matrix will be uh, surrounding your analyte molecules so that the majority of the impact is kind of taken by the matrix and only the energy enough to, you know, transfer the charge from the uh, matrix to the analyte. Uh, okay, how do I put this? Okay, I'll explain it to you with the diagram. Okay, don't worry. So soon Koichi Tanaka and his colleagues from Japan successfully soft ionized bigger molecules by using nitrogen laser for ionization. So here laser was being used, nitrogen laser was being used for this ionization technique. Later in 2002, Tanaka won one quarter of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his contribution in development of the soft desorption ionization technique for mass spectrometric analysis of biological macromolecules. Because it was a very important discovery at that time, or invention at that time, sorry. So, Karras and Hillenkamp subsequently improved the technique based on the concept of soft ionization. And as a result, the first matrix assisted laser desorption ionization, that is from MALDI, okay, matrix assisted laser desorption ionization instrument, was commercially available in the early 1990s. Okay, so that is the development of MALDI MS. What is TOF? So in the late 1950s, so this is way before MALDI came into the picture, okay, in late 1950s itself, the technology of time of flight had already been invented, a technique in which charged ions were forced to fly from a source to the detector so that they could be identified based on the time of their flight to the ion detector. So what is the time taken for an ion to reach the detector while going, passing through a uh, length of a tube okay so based on that they were trying to detect ions okay so that concept was already uh, discovered in the late 1950s but TOF was suffering from its poor resolution and did not find its application in MS techniques only later it was realized that the combination of MALDI MS and TOF technology can result in a highly sensitive technique that today we know as MALDI TOF MS. Okay, so that is how all of that came together and you understood that even though uh, TOF, TOF did not have a uh, lot of application in the traditional MS, when, it, when you combine it with MALDI, it made a lot of sense and this technique of MALDI TOF MS came into being. Okay, so that is about MALDI of MS. Now we'll be going into detail about what is MALDI, how does it cause that ionization, then we'll be seeing what is TOF, and then we'll see the common flowchart of a MALDI of MS. Okay, so let's see. MALDI. 
Okay. So as I told you, MALD is nothing but matrix assisted laser desorption ionization. Okay. So I'll not be saying it again and again. Uh, it is abbreviated for a very good reason because it's such a long name. Okay. So MALDI is a soft ionization that involves a laser striking a matrix of small molecules to make the analyte molecules into the gas phase without fragmenting or decomposing them. Okay. So that is the basis of it. It's a soft ionization technique. MALDI is appropriate to analyze biomolecules like peptides, lipids, saccharides, or other organic molecules. So very useful for in the field of proteomics, right? So what is the mechanism behind MALDI? Okay, so it consists of basically three steps. We'll be seeing what those three steps are. Okay, first one is formation of a solid solution. It's kind of, what is this solid solution? How can a solid be a solution, right? We'll see what it is, okay. So the analyte to be investigated, whatever you want to find out or whatever you're going to find out through the mass spectrometry now, it is typically dissolved in a solvent, okay? Any suitable solvent which can dissolve your analyte, which contains an appropriate matrix compound. So you have your analyte, it is dissolved in a solvent, plus you put something called a matrix, okay? And uh, you dissolve everything together, okay? You mix everything together, then what do you do? On the target plate, wherever you're going to hit the laser, right? On the target plate, you're going to deposit the solid solution, okay? Of analyte doped matrix crystals, it is formed. Uh, you pour it on the, suppose you're pouring it on the target plate, what will happen? The solvent in which you dissolved your uh, analyte, no, that will evaporate off. So what you will be left with on the plate is nothing but your analyte which is you know mixed with your matrix so that will be deposited and you will get a solid solution deposited on your target plate so that is the first step that takes place okay and so as a result molecules of the analytes are embedded in an excess of matrix molecules so it will be always in excess the matrix is always in excess and it's kind of protecting your analyte Okay, it is essential for the matrix to be in excess, thus leading to the analyte molecules being completely isolated from each other. So once you're mixing the analyte and the matrix, right, it will also help in separating out the analyte from each other. Okay, so you will see it in the diagram, you'll understand it better. So this eases the formation of the homogeneous solid solution required to produce a stable desorption of the analyte. So this is what I was talking about. This is your target plate or your sample plate. On that, you're going to pour in the uh, uh, analyte matrix uh, mixed in a solvent. Once you pour it out, solvent is evaporated and you'll be left with a solid solution of analyte and your uh, matrix, right? So all these green particles that you see are your analyte. This is just for an example, okay? And it is surrounded by all these small blue, blue particles, which is nothing but your matrix. So you can see how well it is se separating out these different macromolecules, right? So that is your first step. Second step is the matrix excitation. Okay, so what happens there? The laser beam is focused onto the surface of the matrix analyzed solution. The matrix chromophobe, uh, chromophore absorbs the laser irradiation causing rapid vibrational excitation and bringing about localized disintegration of the solid solution. So what is happening? You had your solid solution plated, right? And then you're going to hit it with laser. So wherever the laser comes and hits uh, your matrix chromophore, it gets uh, photo excited, you can say. So that vibrational excitation causes a localized disintegration of the matrix. So along with the matrix, your analyte will also be dissolved from the solid support, okay? So the clusters ejected from the surface consists of analyte molecules surrounded by matrix and salt ions. The matrix molecules evaporate away from the clusters to leave the free analyte in the gas phase. So what happens? You have your dissolved matrix analyte, which is, you know, surrounding your an uh, analyte, right? So uh, the matrix surrounding that analyte will be uh, evaporated and you will have free analyte in the gas phase. Okay, so that is the second step of matrix, ex matrix ex excitation. So the most widely accepted mechanism of primary ionization involves generation of charged species within a cluster ablation process or gas phase proton transfer in the expanding plume from photoionized matrix molecules. You will understand it in the third step, how that charge is being transferred or proton is being transferred. 
So the ions in the gas phase are then accelerated by an electrostatic field and move towards the analyzer. So we'll go into that step one. Uh, we'll see. Okay. So this is the second step. What is happening is your laser is hitting your uh, solid solution. So you have a uh, desorption of the and light molecules surrounded by the matrix. So that is what ha is happening basically in the second step. Okay, let's see what is the third step. Third step is the analyte ionization. Okay, so as I told you, MALDI is the ionization source in your uh, MALDI of MS, right? So uh, how does it uh, ionize the analyte without fragmenting it? That is what is the basis of MALDI. So how is it done? So you have the photo excited matrix, right? The photo excited matrix molecules are stabilized through proton transfer to the analyte. So right now they're excited because of the laser, they're excited, right? So they need to be stabilized. How do they get stabilized? They transfer their proton to the analyte. Okay. So cation attachment to the analyte is also encouraged during this process. It is in this way that the characteristics M plus X uh, positively charged uh, analyte molecule where X could be your hydrogen, sodium or potassium. So analytes are formed. You have your positively charged uh, analytes that are formed. So these ionization reactions take place in the desorbed matrix analyte cloud just above the surface. So uh, one second, I'll show it to you with the diagram. So you can see over here, right? You have your desorbed analyte surrounded by the matrix. Uh, what happens over here is uh, the proton from your uh, matrix is transferred to your analyte molecule. So the, your analyte now becomes positively charged. And in the same process, simultaneously, all these things are happening. Proton transfer is happening. Your uh, matrix is becoming more stabilized and it is also evaporating up. So you will get your free uh, positively charged uh, analyte molecules, which will now be sent to the mass analyzer. Okay. So what are the commonly used matrices for MALDI and what are the commonly used lasers? Okay, we'll be seeing that in brief. So matrix choice and optimization of the sample preparation protocol are the most important steps in MALDI experiments. The final selection is always related to the chemical nature of the analyte and the respective laser wavelength. So of course, you need to have a compatible matrix to that of the analyte. Okay, there should be a compatibility between both. So the most effective MALDI matrix must simultaneously meet a number of general requirements. So what are the requirements of while, while you're selecting a matrix, right? What and all should you keep in mind? First of all, it should have a strong absorbance of the laser light at a given wavelength. Second, ability to sublime. I hope you know the meaning of sublimation, right? So if you're talking about a normal reaction, suppose you have ice, right? Ice first turns into water, that is uh, from solid, it becomes liquid. Then it, when you further increase the temperature, it evaporates or becomes a gaseous state. That is a conventional way how uh, solid to liquid to gas it happens. But sublimation is when you have a solid substance, it is directly converted into a gaseous state. There's no intermediate liquid phase. So that process is called sublimation. So your matrix should be able to sublime, right? It should be able to turn into gaseous phase. So that is how it will be giving you a free analyte because your matrix is surrounding your analyte. So once the charge transfer where everything has happened up, you need that the matrix should be uh, evaporated or should turn into gaseous phase. Okay. Uh, third thing is vacuum stability, then promotion of analyte ionization. So it should be in such a way that the protons, it should aid in the proton transfer from the matrix to your analyte. So that's, that's that only then the purpose of uh, MALGI will be served. Solubility in analyte com compatible solvents. So in the first step we are doing, making the solid solution. So this matrix should also be compatible with the solvent. Uh, then lack of reactivity. It should not be a reactive substance, of course, right? So in general, highly polar analytes work better with highly polar matrices and non-polar analytes are preferably combined with non-polar matrices, so like with like. Currently, the most commonly used matrices are alpha cyano, 4 hydroxyceramic acid, 2 5 dihydroxybenzoic acid, 3 5 dimethoxy, 4 hydrocinamic acid, and 2 6 hydroxyacetophenone. Just remember, it is one of the matrices. Just remember alpha cyano, 4 hydroxyceramic acid. Okay. Most commonly used. Now, lasers used in MALTI. Lasers of both ultraviolet, that is UV, and infrared wavelengths are in use. 
but UV lasers are fi by far the most important light sources in analytical multi. Among these, nitrogen lasers and frequency tripled or quadruple NDAG. Okay, those uh, NDAG lasers are more commonly used and they serve in a majority of the applications. Okay. Okay, so that was about MALDI, okay, how MALDI acts as the ionization source. So how do you get positively charged analyte molecules without decomposing? Your analyte is not decomposed, but it is charged now, okay. So next step is uh, the mass analysis, right? So that is done by a mass analyzer called time of flight, or in short, we call it as TOF, okay. So let's see what that is. So time of flight. The principle of time of flight mass analyzer involves the separation of ions based on time it takes for the ions to travel through a flight tube with known length and reach the detector. So it's the basic formula of speed is equal to distance by time, right? So you will be knowing the distance. Distance is nothing but the length of the tube. And from that time is how much time it takes from the ion to travel through that, okay? And speed will be determined by the electric field that is applied right whatever is the charge uh, on that it will depend okay so here an ion's mass to charge ratio is determined via a time of flight measurement so we'll be seeing how the mass to charge ratio depends on the time of flight with a small derivation okay you'll understand it it's a very easy derivation just to make you understand that the mass to charge ratio uh, is dependent on or the time of flight is dependent on the mass to charge ratio so this time will depend on velocity of the ion and therefore it's a measure of its mass to charge ratio because how fast or how slow a particle is moving will depend on its mass, it will depend on its charge and thereby it will depend on its mass to charge ratio. So yeah, so uh, we're going to see the derivation part, okay? So the ratio that we have, right? The mass to charge ratio and other experimental known parameters, we can identify the ion because a specific ion will have a specific TOF, okay? And it's relative, uh, what is a mass to charge ratio. So with that, we're going to detect, okay? Basically mass analyzer will help us in the detection process. Detection will be done by other detectors, but uh, it will help us to sort out the ions. The potential energy of a charged particle in an electric field is related to the charge of the particle and to the strength of electric field. So what is the potential energy? Z E V S, where Z is the charge number, E is the elemental charge of the particle, V S is the electrical potential difference, also known as a voltage. Okay, so we're just going to see the derivation, how the time of flight is dependent on the mass to charge ratio. Okay. So when the charged particle is accelerated into time of flight tube or TOF tube or flight tube by the voltage V, its potential energy is converted to kinetic energy, right? So the kinetic energy of any mass is nothing but half mv squared. So this and all is basic physics you might have learned now. So where V will be the velocity and m is the mass of the particle, okay? So in effect, the potential energy is the one that is being converted to the kinetic energy. That means what potential energy is equal to kinetic energy. So that's what we have equated over here. This can be rearranged as V or velocity is equal to square root of 2EZ VS by divided. Also, the velocity of the particle can be determined in the time of flight tube. Why? Because we know the length of the tube and we know the time. That is the time of flight, how much time the ion takes from uh, to tra travel through the length of tube L. So from that, we know that velocity or speed is equal to distance by time. So V is equal to L by T. From that, T or time of flight is equal to L by V. And we already have a formula for velocity. So we'll put this over here for V and you will get a equation something like this for time of flight. Okay, so it can be rearranged like this. What does this reveal? This reveals more clearly that the time of flight of the ion varies with the square root of its mass to charge ratio. So you can see how that is dependent on the mass to charge ratio. So basically, in time of flight mass spectrometry, ionized oligomolecules are accelerated by an electrostatic field in the mass analyzer with a common kinetic energy. With the same kinetic energy, lighter ions travel faster and heavier ions travel more slowly. So basically, you will try to provide a common kinetic energy for all the molecules, okay? So if the speed is same, so what will the time depend on? The mass of the ions, right? The heavier ones will move slower than the lighter ones, okay? So the ionized particles enter at one end of the TOF 
tube. So where are these ionized particles coming from? We have it from the MALDI, right? MALDI has the one which has uh, ionized these oligomolecules. Oligomolecules are nothing but macromolecules, okay? So the ionized particles enter at one end of the TOF and the number of ions reaching a detector at the other end is recorded in a time dependent manner. So how long are these molecules taking to cross this particular tube and reach the detector? Okay, so that is recorded. The lightest ions reach the detector first and the heaviest arrive last as discussed, right? So the entire mass spectrum is recorded in a fraction of a second as an ion flux versus time. Ion flux means movement of ions, okay? So this all happens like in a fraction of a second. We are talking about it uh, taking so much of time, but all of this takes very less time. Okay, why we will see, okay. So theoretically, all the ions are given the same initial kinetic energy so that after drifting along the field-free region, the ions of the same mass by charge uh, uh, at the detector, uh, the ions of the same mass by charge will reach the detector at the same time. Okay, because the kinetic energy is same, so if the mass by charge ratio is the same, of course they should take the same time, right? So this is what happens in a liner top analyzer. You have your target which is hit by a laser and uh, different molecules are passing and reaching the detector. Okay, this is a normal setup. But in practice, the pulse is not felt by all ions to the same intensity. And so not all the ions of the same mass by charge values reach their ideal velocities. So we are not able to provide an ideal uh, situation where all the molecules are having equal kinetic charge. That is what is happening. Okay, so they're not reaching their ideal velocities. So what happens if you see over here, uh, some ions, will have different starting times okay so even though they might have the same kinetic energy but they start at a later stage okay that could be one case some ions they can have different kinetic energy itself so they're not feeling the same pulse of laser and uh, somehow their kinetic energies are different so they, again they will reach the at different times so even if they're having the same mass to charge ratio these factors could be you know uh, causing a uh, difference uh, they might have a different starting location. They might have different initial directions of motions. Okay, sometimes they might be passing in first going in this direction, then coming back to this direction. So all these things, so even though uh, mass by charge ratio is the same, these molecules will not reach the detector at the same time. So that will cause us an anomaly, right? Because ideally, uh, molecules with the same mass by charge ratio should reach the detector at the same time because we in an ideal situation we are saying that all of them have the same kinetic energy all of them are starting at the same point but that is not happening so what what do we do about that so to correct this problem a reflection is often applied to the end of the drift zone the reflectron consists of a series of ring electrodes with high voltage, which can rip, repulse the ions back along the flight tube, usually at a slightly displaced angle. So I'll show that to you, wait, okay. So ions of different kinetic energy penetrate the reflectron to different depths before they get expelled from the reflectron into the opposite direction. So faster ions carrying more kinetic energy will travel a longer path than the slower ones and thus spend more time with the reflectron than slower ions ca carrying less kinetic energy. In that way, the detector receives ions of the same mass at about the same time. Thereby, this design for TOF mass analyzer has increased the resolution significantly. So I'll show you what you with this diagram. This is a diagram of reflectron TOF analyzer. So what happens over here, you have the uh, suppose you have two analytes of the same mass to charge ratio, but due to some reason, their kinetic energy is different. The energy that they have taken in, you know, from the pulse is different. What happens if you have a reflectron placed over here, the ones with a smaller or lesser kinetic energy, you know, they will not travel much into this reflectron and they'll be reflected back at a certain angle. But those with a higher kinetic energy will be uh, will travel more inside this reflectron and uh, the time will be compensated. It happens in such a way that now both these particles will hit the detector at the same time. So it is kind of a correction, okay? It is kind of a correction that happens in reflectron TOF analyzer, okay? So here you can see another figure, okay? So the figure demonstrates schematically how a reflectron TOF, TOF instrument can be used to correct for the energy distributions and thus increase the resolution of the mass analysis. So in row one, that is this one, the two separate ions 
of different mass by charge ratio experience the same extraction pulse and thus travels at different speeds and have discrete time of flights and are thus detected separately. Of course, if they have different mass and they are going with the same velocity means the smaller ones or the lighter ones will go and hit the detector first and you can see the peak over here. Second one will come like this. Okay, uh, will come second. They will have different time of flight and you can detect it very easily. In row two, the ions have the same mass by charge ratio, but so here the mass by charge ratio is the same, but they experience different extraction pulses due to them having different initial potential energies. So they are indicated by green and red over here. This leads to the arriving at the detector at slightly different time, leading to a reduction in resolution. That is the broadening of peaks. So though they're of the same mass by charge ratio, you can see that, you know, they are reaching slightly at a different time. So they will have a broader peak. And always we are uh, looking for a narrow peak, right? Because that tells us that your sample is res resolved very well. So here resolution is not there, right? So this can be corrected for by use of a reflector, which is shown over here, which refocuses the ions by mass, thus increasing the resolution. So we already saw the principle of a reflector, right? The one which was having a lesser kinetic energy will not travel much into the reflectron and will be reflected or uh, deflected in a slightly different angle. And the one which is having a higher kinetic energy will travel more. So the distance is covered over there. So both of these will reach the detector at the same time, giving you a narrower peak. Okay. So that was the concept of TOF, that is uh, time of flight mass analyzer. So how do we put all these together, MALDI-TOF MS, right? So in MALDI-TOF mass spectrometry, the ion source is matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization, okay, MALDI, and the mass analyzer is time of flight, TOF, okay? So this is the complete setup. The sample is mixed with a matrix on a conductive metal plate. So you can see that over here, you, your sample is mixed with your matrix. After crystallization of the matrix and microbial material, the microbial material basically uh, what I'm trying to say, it could be a proteome or whatever you're trying to analyze, okay? Your analyte. The metal plate is introduced in the mass spectrometer and is bombarded with brief laser pulses. So you can see laser pulses being bombarding, bombarding your sample over here. The desorbed and ionized molecules are accelerated through an electrostatic field and ejected through a metal flight tube. So you can see your flight tube over here. Uh, uh, sorry, ejected through a metal flight tube, subjected to vacuum until the reacher detector. So you can see the detector over here with smaller ions traveling faster than the larger ions. Okay. Thus, bioanalyzed separated according to their TOF create a mass spectrum. You can see the mass spectrum over here by mass to charge ratio peaks with varying intensities, okay? A spectrum is thus a signature that is compared with the library database for identification. So whatever spectrum you get over here, you can compare it with the ones in your library. You might be uh, carrying out so many mass spectrometry for standards, or, okay, you might be having many standards mass spectrometers. So with that, you can compare your analyze and you can see which, if at certain point, this peak is coming means it could be this particular analyte or this could be the ion that that we have got okay so i hope you have understood what is multit of ms and how we are using it for the detection of macromolecules specifically in the field of proteomics it is very much useful okay so let us see the major applications of multit of ms okay first of all is intact mass determination the intact mass determination is basic and important for protein characterization as the correct molecular weight of a protein can indicate its, its intact structure. Okay. The performance of multi-TOF MS is less affected by buffer components, detergents, and contaminants. Right? So in addition, it permits intact protein mass determination with sufficient accuracy. That is for less than 500 ppm for sequence validation. After protein digestion, Maldi-TOF MS can be used to analyze the obtained peptides for further primary sequence confirmation by peptide mass fingerprinting. We'll be seeing what is peptide mass fingerprinting. Okay. So what is peptide mass fingerprinting? This is also one of the major applications of Maldi-TOF MS where Maldi-TOF MS is used. Okay. 
The amino acid sequence of each protein is unique and therefore the set of peptide masses resulting from proteolytic cleavage provides a fingerprint of the protein. So it's kind of like, you know, you have proteins, right? If you remember from the first class, you'll be knowing that uh, proteins are formed out of amino acids, right? Amino acids join together, they give peptides and a long peptide chain is folded in different ways to give you an active protein. So different proteins will have different amino acids which are, you know, are forming it. So when you're subjected to a proteolytic cleavage, you will get a fingerprint because they will be broken down at different sites, right? So just like in DNA fingerprinting, a particular fragment of DNA is cut by particular restriction enzymes and it gives a pattern, right? And it is easier to compare. So for example, you have uh, my DNA sample and you're uh, uh, analyzing my DNA sample with a particular set of restriction enzyme, you'll get a particular restriction pattern, right? Suppose I committed a crime or something and I, you've got my sample from the crime scene, you have other people's sample. So when you're uh, going to analyze all those samples with the same restriction enzyme, the pattern that matches uh, will we'll be able to come to the conclusion that, for example, an unknown sample matches with my fingerprint, that is my DNA fingerprint. That means I could be the one who is involved in that crime. So that is how DNA fingerprinting happens. Likewise, sorry for a very big uh, example. Okay, so likewise, you can also have a fingerprint for a protein. Okay, with where and all the proteolytic cleavage happens. Okay, uh, it could be different for different proteins. So in the peptide mass fingerprinting technique, an unknown protein is reduced and alkylated. That is to break any disulfide bonds. So if you look at the protein structures now, it has quaternary, tertiary structure, quaternary structure. These are all stabilized by disulfide bonds. So first of all, you'll be breaking down those disulfide bonds. These are then digested enzymatically using a sequence specific proteolytic enzyme such as trypsin. Okay. Next, the masses of the resulting peptides are measured using the mass spectrometer. The list of peptide masses from the spectra is entered into a search program such as MASCOT or PROFOUND. Okay, these are all programs which will help you in um, matching. The software then searches through databases of amino acid sequence information, for example, maybe SwissProt or NCBI. Okay, so for each protein entry in the database, the software uses the amino acid sequence to predict the peptide masses that would result from the digestion with the user specified enzyme. So whatever entry is there in your database uh, this program is the software what it does is it will predict okay this particular amino acid sequence will have uh, this particular peptide masses that will be resulted from the digestion okay so the software then compares the list of the peptide masses measured to the list of predicted peptide masses and calculates the probability of a match the result is a list of possible protein identification and the probability that each identification is correct so it's all a probability but then it helps in a lot of uh, detection work. Okay. Another uh, application could be oligonucleotide analysis. So with the de development of molecular biology techniques and antisense nucleic acid drug technologies, more and more oligonucleotide fragments have been synthesized to be used as primers, probes, and antisense drugs, right? So multi of MS is by far the best means of quickly detecting oligonucleotide fragments and determine whether the synthesis is complete and whether the synthesized sequence is correct. So oligonucleotide analysis using multi of MS is simple, rapid, accurate, and sensitive. So I'm not going into the complete depth of each application, but uh, just to give you an overall uh, view of where it could be used. Another application could be multi-imaging. The multi of can be used in profiling and imaging proteins directly from thin tissue sections, known as multi-imaging mass spectrometry. So it provides specific information about the local molecular composition, relative abundance, and spatial distribution of peptides and proteins in the analyzed section. Multi-IMS can analyze multiple unknown compounds in biological tissue sections simultaneously through a single measurement that can obtain molecular imaging of the tissue while maintaining the integrity of the cells and molecules in the tissue. So basically it is for molecular imaging, okay, without damaging the cells and without damaging the molecules in the tissue. 
Another application could be in the field of microbiology. So multitude of spectra are often used for the identification of microorganisms, such as a bacteria or fungi. It's one of the most interesting applications of multitude of MS, you know, to actually identify microorganisms using multitude of MS. Can you imagine? So a portion of a colony of the microbe in question is placed onto the sample target and overlaid with the matrix. So here your sample would be your colony of bacteria or whichever microorganism you're trying to identify. The mass spectra of the expressed proteins generated are analyzed by dedicated software and compared with stored profiles for species determination in what is known as biotyping. So here you have a peek into biotyping also. This is a very uh, big application part of uh, Malitov and it requires a lot of detailed studying. I have just briefed it up over here. Okay. So it offers benefits to other immunological or biochemical procedures and has become a common method for species identification in clinical microbiological laboratories. So basically whatever protein is being uh, expressed in the microbial colony, right, that will be detected by this multitop and that will be compared with the databases you have. So if in databases it, it matches, it will help us to identify this particular microorganism, something called biotyping. Okay. So end note or in conclusion, Multitude of MS has been applied to the analysis of biomolecules, basically biopolymers such as DNA, proteins, peptides, and sugars, and large organic molecules such as polymers, dendrimers, and other micromolecules, which tend to be fragile and fragment when ionized by more conventional ionization methods. That means if you, you cannot use hard ionization techniques on these, okay? So it is a high throughput, cost-effective method with a high degree of accuracy. Okay. So with that, we come to the end of... Uh, the session on multitude of MS. Uh, students, if you have any doubt regarding this, please do ask me. Okay. So before I close the class, the thought for the day is the grass is greener where you water it. So you might have uh, heard uh, many old tales, right? The uh, grass is greener on the other side, or we have heard that. But this is a twist in that the grass is greener where you water it. So where do you choose to invest your time, your potential? That side will become more flourished, okay? You might have even heard stories about the good wolf and the bad wolf. Okay, I'm not going into all that. So whatever you water, whatever you invest your time, your talent, and your thoughts into, that is what is going to uh, develop more. So make sure you're watering the grass at the right side or you're watering the right grass, okay? So with that, I'll give you. So that was the class on Malditov MS. If you like this video, if you understood something about Malditov, please do not forget to like, share and subscribe to this YouTube channel, Comprehend Biotech. And I try to present a difficult topics in the most simplest way possible in a conventional classroom setup. So if you did enjoy it, please give it a thumbs up, okay? And if you have any suggestions or any feedback, please uh, do comment in the comment box, okay? So until next class, see you. Bye.